Striker Scorpion 82 is now sponsored by Warhammer Combat Cards, a card battle game featuring your favourite Citadel miniatures from the 40k universe. Build your army decks, dominate opponents in player versus player action, collect and upgrade cards to fit your strategy, improve their power and unlock unique traits. Choose from all 40k factions, take part in campaigns based on iconic 40k battles, rise to the top of the leaderboard and win glory. Free to download and play, link is in the video description below or on the channel homepage and by using the unique link it helps support the channel. Thanks and enjoy the game. Alright, welcome to this video. Uh, the point of this one here is to help you, if you're already playing 8th edition, uh, to help you transition over to 9th edition. So I've gone through the book here uh, as carefully as I can and to pick out really just the changes. So anything that's different from 8th edition uh, and is now changed as we go into 9th edition, I'm going to try and pick those out, work our way through the rule book here. I'm going to focus in on the core rules here, so sort of your uh, the uh, the different phases of each turn. I'm going to go through the main changes there. I may well do a part two uh, to this uh, video here to try and help you through with things like missions and building armies and uh, rules like that. So I may well do this in two parts, but I'm, in this video I'm going to focus in on the main rules, uh, sort of the core rules uh, here, uh, and to try and point out and help you out uh, with the different changes. Uh, that have taken place. Not too much really. Uh, if you're already used to 8th edition, then a lot of what 9th edition at uh, Warhammer 40,000 is about will be very familiar to you, thankfully. So the transition hopefully uh, will be quite smooth. And uh, the idea is this video will help you uh, make that switch as smoothly as possible. So uh, if you like the video and the video has helped you, please hit the like button uh, on the video. It really, really helps me out uh, and helps boost the video. Uh, and the channel and it's much appreciated just hit the video uh, like button and uh, that really helps so uh, one thing I would say uh, is to uh, follow the video through uh, and then check the comment section see what other people are saying if I, I miss a rule or misinterpret a, a rule perhaps uh, then check out the comments see what others are saying and if you go by the comment section because uh, if I make a mistake people are going to pick it up 99.9% uh, .9 of the time uh, and then I reckon 90-95% of, of the rules here I'll, I'll catch and get right and then just uh, the other viewers checking uh, and leaving comments means that you should pretty much get uh, all the changes here in this video. So basic rules uh, I'll pass over some areas that really haven't changed um, I'll sort of clarify that they, they haven't changed for you so unit coherency first of all and um, what they're saying here uh, is, and what you get here for 9th edition, which is quite handy, you get this, it's a bit more wordy uh, than 8th edition was, uh, more explanation going on, but they do have these summary boxes here uh, with these red squares, and that gives you sort of the summary uh, of each rule section. It's very handy if you're trying to reference uh, different parts of the rules. But for unit coherency, it's 2 inches horizontally and five inches vertically. So if there's buildings involved, uh, such as like my Admech terrain, which is about five inches high, uh, then you can have a model at the bottom, model at the top, and you're still maintaining unit coherency. So they've clarified that and made it nice and clear. Uh, then, this is a new part here. Uh, whilst the unit has six or more models, so uh, horde units especially, each model must be in unit coherency with two other models from their own units. So, uh, it's no more con gliding, huge long lines of hordes. Uh, now you've got a, a bunch together, sort of form two ranks uh, with hordes star units. I think it's a good rule. It means units are going to look more like a unit, sort of strong right out. So I, that rule seems to be fine. Uh, but that is 
a new rule that they've added in and it's really just to combat people performing strings of, of horde units uh, acting as screens uh, and units spread out so instead they're forcing you to bunch them together but they should end up looking more like units on the table um, so I think it's a good move uh, then moving on they have something what's called engagement range really that's just within an inch of an enemy model is engagement range uh, the range for that is an inch uh, but also they've said tier 5 inches vertically as well so again you can have a model at the base uh, of my admec terrain and then a model at the top within 5 inches that counts as engagement range so you can fight you know models can charge at the, at the base of a taller building uh, and be within engagement range of unit at the, at the top 5 inches up and still fight them in close combat and they, they clarified that to make it clear I had a, a few instances of, of what do we do in this situation where models couldn't reach the top of a building uh, but I wanted to they made their charge distance for example well now that's been clarified there uh, with the engagement range rule uh, measuring distances I think has pretty much remained the same so I'd, I'd, I'll not go through all of that uh, they've what we've got here is a clarification now within and wholly within. Remember there's a lot of arguments or discussion about what counts as uh, within and wholly within. Well they've now clarified that. So within means any part of model's base or hull. Uh, model wholly within every part of the model's base or hull uh, has to be within. Unit within uh, is any model within. And then unit wholly within every model wholly within. So things like custom force field if it says wholly within then Every model or all, every part of the vehicle has to be within that, uh, and then uh, it just says within whether it's a unit or a, uh, a unit, then just one part of the base of the model uh, counts as within. But they've clarified that now, so nice and clear. Uh, dice then, and this is like a tweaked eighth edition. They, you know, areas where there was a bit of confusion. Uh, Games Workshop have made sure they've clarified those areas for you to make them nice and clear uh, here uh, in the 9th edition rules. So there's a clarification here about modifiers, uh, making it nice and clear. Apply modifiers in the following order, so division first, then multiplication, so like times two strength for example for a power fist, then addition, and then comes subtraction, you know, minus one to hit rolls, that comes last. Um, so clarifying that. Uh, then there's a clarification here for re-rolls. Uh, so again, a discussion that went on during 8th edition. Um, so re-rolls are applied before modifiers. So you fire at a target uh, and it's threes to hit, but there's minus one to hit rolls. Well, you roll up all your dice hitting on threes. Uh, and then say so you get a few re-rolls that are available. Uh, you take off the ones that would have naturally missed, so that's the ones and twos. Uh, you reroll those, uh, and then you apply your modifiers. And in which case, if it's minus one, any threes actually become misses, and you, you couldn't reroll them uh, because originally they would have been a hit without the modifier. So they've, they've clarified that and made it nice and clear. Uh, everyone's playing by that rule anyway, but uh, they've made it clear here for the ninth edition. Add. So roll offs, I think it's the same sequencing as well. Um, so uh, if several rules must be resolved at the same time, the player whose turn it is chooses the order to resolve them. Um, so that's that. Then add aura abilities here, clarification. Some abilities affect models or units in a given range. These are aura abilities. A model with an aura ability is always within range of its effect, so models are affected by their own bubble, basically, so that's been clarified. Uh, the effects of multiple identically named aura abilities are not cumulative, i.e. if a unit within half range of two models with the same aura ability, that aura ability only applies to the unit once. I think that's a change, I just marked it as sort of a, a clarification. Uh, modifying characteristics. Um, so all characteristics modifiers are cumulative, Apply modifiers in the following order, division, multiplication, addition, then subtraction, uh, round uh, fractions up after applying all modifiers, uh, strength, toughness and tax, leadership can never be modified below one, random move characteristics determined for the whole unit each time it moves, uh, other random characteristics determined individually when characteristic required, and then characteristic of dash can never be modified. So. 
Uh, they've given you an example. It's not as examples are good for explaining the rules. So Space Marine Sergeant, strength four, is making an attack with a power fist. That's strength times two. While under the effects of a psychic power, that increases his strength characteristic by one. So the two modifiers, times two and plus one, are cumulative and applied concurrently. So the attack is therefore resolved at strength nine. So it's strength four times two, which is eight, then plus one strength is nine. And, and people have been playing that way already, but again, uh, just making it nice and clear just there. So going on to the, the battle round uh, next. Uh, it, it's all familiar here, much remains the same, apart from a new phase being added in at the start, which isn't too significant at this stage. Games Workshop may well expand on this uh, to make more use of the command phase. But command phase comes first, uh, then you've got your movement, psychic, shooting, charge, fight phase, and then morale phase. So seven phases, six were already being used, and then the, the new one is the command phase. So the command phase, at the moment, uh, battle-forged armies... Uh, get a command points bonus. You get one command point at the start of your command phase if your army's battle forged. Uh, then it says resolve any rules that occur in the command phase. It's, you know, you'll be told that as, as time goes on and new units and rules are released. Then just progress to the movement phase. So at the moment it's very small. Just get an extra command point at the start of your turn. So no real panic there with that one. Right, into the movement phase. I just think it's pretty much the same. Uh, there's a, I've question marked this a new term, remains stationary. Uh, models uh, cannot move this phase, so I remain stationary. It's pretty obvious what that is anyway, just sitting still. Fallbacks the same, normal movement, advancings remain the same, you move plus a d6. Uh, so. There's no real, I don't really need to go through all of that. Um, just trying to pick out the changes here. Right, reinforcements then. Uh, this has uh, been changed around. So, uh, reinforcement unit, this units, unit that starts the battle in location other than the battlefield. Uh, set up your reinforcement units one at a time as described by the rules, then let them start the battle in locations other than the battlefield. Uh, then reinforcement units cannot make norm a normal move and advance fall back or remain stationary this turn. Reinforcement units always count as having moved this turn, which is already uh, there in 8th edition. Any reinforcement units not set up on the battlefield by the end of the battle counts as destroyed. Again, the same as 8th. And then once all your reinforcement units have been set up, progress to the psychic phase. So just a more of a clarification there um, for that one. Then again, mark this as a just a clarification, I call it out, it's talking about moving over terrain. Models can move freely over terrain features one inch or less in height. Models cannot move through taller terrain features but can climb up and down them. So you reach something that's an inch or less in height, you just move straight for it. Say some barbed wire, for example, on the, on the ground that's quite low, uh, or some bumpy terrain. Uh, as soon as you start to get over an inch, then you've got to start paying inches to climb up and across and then down again, or whatever it may be. So bit of a clarification just there. Uh, you know, talking about transports here. Uh, so embarking. Yep. I think it's pretty much remained the same. Uh, it's pretty much following the usual rules for embarking and disembarking from vehicles. I've marked this as a clarification. I'll call this out. Units can embark in a friendly transport if every model ends a normal move. An advance or a fallback move within three inches of it. I think that's remained the same. A unit cannot embark within a transport that is within engagement range of any enemy models. So if your Rhino is currently locked in close combat, but you can get around the back, perhaps you're not allowed to embark inside it. A unit cannot uh, a unit cannot embark and disembark in the same phase. Uh, units cannot do anything or be affected in any way whilst they're embarked within a transport. So can't manifest a psychic power, for example. Then disembarking. Uh, yeah, I'll, um, it says clarification, so I'll, I'll just call this out. So units that disembark can then act normally. So uh, move, shoot, charge, fight, and so on in the remainder of the turn, but its models count as having moved that turn, even if they're not moved further. So you disembark, you don't move, but that disembarking does count 
as moving, so you know, an effect on different weapons. Uh, units that start their move phase embarked in a transport can disembark this phase. Unit must disembark before the transport moves. So it's the same order. Uh, you do your disembarkation first before the vehicle moves off. So the same as 8th edition. Uh, and then you deploy wholly within three inches. Notice that notice the term here, wholly within. So every model and base is going to be right within that three inches. Uh, of the transport, not within engagement range uh, of any enemy models. Units that have disembarked count as having moved this turn. And then down here, destroy transports. So if transport is destroyed, a uh, resolve its explodes ability if it has one. Any units embarked must then disembark for a d6. Any ones models destroyed. Same as 8th edition. Units that disembarked cannot charge or perform heroic interventions at this turn. Okay, so as uh, aircraft, so uh, there's been uh, a fair bit of discussion about this, the way it's changed. So we'll need to uh, head over a few pages here to get to the rules for this. Um, so I'll read this one here. It's, uh, if an aircraft model cannot make its minimum move, or its minimum move would result as any part of that model, including its base crossing the edge of the battlefield, then unless you're using the strategic reserves rule, I think most people are going to use that rule, uh, that model is removed from the battlefield and counted as destroyed. Uh, if the aircraft is a transport, then any models currently embarked within it are likewise counted as destroyed. The strategic reserves rule is described on page 256 to 57. So we're going to take a look at that now. Uh, to get the rules on that. I think it's an improvement and might be able to start using the Storm Raven gunship again, perhaps. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Okay, so this is the new bit here. So, we'll go through this because it's new, this is, you know, this is a, a chunk here that needs to uh, be uh, explained and clarified it. I'll read it carefully, I think uh, is the best tip. So, as uh, you're already able to place units in reserve, but uh, now what you get is you're able to select a number of units that, for example, don't have deep strike ability, but you, now you're able to take these kind of units, you know, say unit space marines, uh, tactical squad, or a squad of intercessors, and you can just put them into reserve. You don't have to have the deep strike ability uh, in there profile for example so you can only place units into into strategic reserve if your army is battle forged unless ever otherwise stated before the battle you can select one or more units from your army to be placed in strategic reserves you must pay command points to place your units into strategic reserves the number of cps required depends on the combined power ratings of all the units you wish to place into, into strategic reserves including those embarked in transport models are themselves placed into reserve. As shown on the table below, uh, if you do not have enough CPs for your current band, you must reduce the number of units you wish to place into reserve. So again, big emphasis down trying to have as many command points as possible, and it can even help you with the number uh, of reserves uh, that you can have. So uh, it should be straightforward enough. You haven't to use power rating, but you should be able to quickly access that via the codex um, you know, you quickly look up two units of Necron Warriors, whatever their power rating is, add it together, and then see if you can put them into reserve. So, at uh, the table here then, combined power rating of units placed into, into strategic reserves. Uh, so 1 to 9 is going to cost you one command point, 10 to 19 is 2, 20 to 29 is 3, and so on and so on, and so on. So, arriving from strategic reserve, Units that are placed in strategic reserve uh, are strategic reserve units and can arrive later in the battle during the reinforcement step in any of your movement phases. Uh, that's page 206, which we've already covered, except your first. So they can't arrive term one. Strategic reserves units cannot arrive on the first battle round. Okay. So then you set them up. And I'll go straight to the summary here. This is interesting, and this is, you need to bear this in mind the way this works now. So battle round one, uh, no strategic reserves. Battle round two, set up wholly within six inches of any battlefield edge, not enemy battlefield edge or an enemy deployment zone. So sort of your own back line, for example, and you've got to deploy wholly within six inches. 
So you've got to bear that in mind as you're bringing reserves in, there is that kind of restriction, you're, just, you're hugging right at the back edge. If you go for battle round three onwards, you can set up wholly within six inches of any battlefield edge, but not the enemy battlefield edge. So you're starting to arrive on the flanks now, it represents the units that have taken more time to move around the flanks. So uh, your option increases there, but you have to wait to turn three onwards. So it seems that no more is there, turn four onwards, reserves are destroyed. You can have a unit turn up on turn four, or turn five, or turn six, as uh, here with this, just says battle round three plus. Uh, you cannot be set up wholly within nine inches of any models, that kind of deep strikey rule still applies uh, even for this. The strategic reserve units cannot make a normal move, advance or fall back this turn. So uh, you can charge, you can move, uh, uh, you cannot make a normal move, you can't advance, so you're sort of stuck to that six inches moving in, and you can't fall back. <clears throat> but um, you can charge though, so you can deploy uh, nine in over nine inches away, and you can attempt to charge when you arrive. Strategic reserve units always count as they've moved this turn, and then any strategic reserve unit not set up on the battlefield by the end of the battle counts as destroyed. So there's a bit more of a stretch now when you can start to bring them onto the battlefield. Uh, then, as uh, aircraft here, it says, can be set up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches from enemy, the enemy when they arrive from strategic reserves. Uh, if an army's battle force, aircraft can move off battlefield edge and be placed into strategic reserves. So, add, to, to have aircraft cycling around, you know, flying off the board and on again, that aircraft needs to go into strategic reserves during the deployment phase. Uh, make sure that you do that. And then that means you're then able to, during the game, once the aircraft is on, it can then go off uh, again. If your army's battle forged and aircraft cannot make its minimum move, it's placed into strategic reserves. And aircraft can arrive from strategic reserves in the next turn. So, I think that's an improvement on the rules. Definitely. And units may be like the Storm Raven gunship, for example. And keep it off the table. And then fly it off again. So, pretty good. And it's how it should be, really. These aircraft having to start on the table didn't really make much sense in 8th edition. So, going back then, that's aircraft as uh, being uh, clarified in the extra rules for reserves covered. Uh, then, the psychic phase, correct me if I'm wrong, is pretty much the same. Uh, smite remains uh, it's a 5 plus to make it go off it does in increment by 1 each time it's attempted uh, as before uh, it's 18 inch range, d3 mortal wounds if you score an 11 or more it's d6 mortal wounds psychic tests I believe are all the same perils just remain the same so but check the comment section you know, there's a little bit here and there I've missed perhaps or misinterpreted then uh, just check the comments section. So, and these are the kind of videos where I appreciate it when you point out if I'm wrong. Because <laughs> it could, it could help people make sure they get the, the rules right here. So then on to shooting phase, and it's pretty much the same. Uh, on these pages at least, uh, I've put a, a label that says clarification, but I, I think it's pretty much the same. You select targets for all weapons before any attacks are resolved. Um, so you actually know, allocate your shooting. Uh, at least one model in the target unit must be visible to the attacking model and within range of the attacking weapon. If a unit targets multiple units, all attacks against one unit must be resolved before we resolve attacks against the next. If a unit shoots multiple weapons, all attacks with weapons that have the same profile must be resolved before resolving attacks to the next. It's pretty much uh, remained the same. So yeah, there's some new bits to come here on these pages. Uh, so, what has changed is heavy weapons. So, for heavy weapons, it used to be, in 8th edition, uh, if you move a heavy weapon, unless you've got some kind of special rule, if you move with a heavy weapon, regardless of what unit you are, it's minus one to the hit rolls. But now, it says, subtract one from the hit rolls if firing model is infantry, and it has moved this turn. So, uh, which was a bit of a, the old rule was a bit, well, if you move with a heavy weapon, it's, it's gone now. Dreadnoughts, vehicles, uh, monsters, I take it, 
uh, no minus to the hit rolls if you're moving and firing heavy weapons. So that's gone. It's just infantry now. So I think it's fair enough. But that's a, a new rule. Then the big guns never tire rule here about tanks. Uh, shooting whilst in close combat. So monsters and vehicles. So it's monsters and vehicles uh, here for this rule. Can shoot ranged weapons even if within engagement range or within an inch of enemy units. You're be fighting when in close combat, you can still fire uh, your weapons. Monsters and vehicles can target other units but cannot resolve these attacks whilst an enemy, any enemy models remain within their engagement range. So I'd I, it's, it's explained better here if I read this carefully, uh, but I'll just call this bit out here. Subtract one from hit rolls made when monsters and vehicles shoot heavy weapons, while an enemy, uh, any enemy units remain within their engagement range. So it's minus one to the hit rolls uh, when shooting heavy weapons. A lot of tanks are equipped with heavy weapons, so it's going to affect them. Uh, but just to clarify this bit here, you can target other units, but cannot resolve these attacks whilst the enemy models remain within their engagement range. So what they're saying here. Uh, is note that if a vehicle or monster unit has more than one ranged weapon, so say a Lehman Rust for example with multiple weapons, you can still ch you can still choose to target units that are not within engagement range of the firing model's unit. So you know you're locked in, you're fighting in close combat, you can declare I'm going to fire the battle cannon way off at, at some other target, even though you're still in close combat. But they will only be able to make the attacks with that weapon if all enemy units within engagement range of the firing model's unit have been destroyed when you come to resolve those attacks. So, for example, you've got a Lehman Rust battle tank, uh, it's fight away in close combat, there's a couple of Gene Steeler cult models within an inch. So you say, right, I'm going to fire the heavy bolters at them, and then I'm going to fire the battle cannon at some other target. So you fire your heavy bolters first and try and clear the infantry away. If you successfully clear the infantry away, uh, and there's no enemy models within engagement range, then you're free to fire the battle cannon at the target you declared. If you fail to clear uh, the enemy models that are within an inch, then you'll not be allowed to resolve your shooting attack uh, with the battle cannon in this case. So a little bit of weighing up your allocation for shooting uh, and targets and taking the risk of making sure the, uh, the engaged models are cleared first before firing other targets. So that's pretty cool rules. I think it's pretty, pretty good. So tapping vehicles out is is gone now and it was a tactic that was extremely effective but also uh, frustra <laughs> frustrating for a lot of people uh, and annoying at times uh, as well and really not really realistic either so now uh, you can shoot whilst in close combat with monsters and vehicles but there's those rules just there. Uh, another new rule here, uh, look out sir. So uh, and this is a, a good rule, I think. You cannot shoot at enemy, an enemy character with nine or less wounds whilst it's within three inches of a friendly unit. So, monster, vehicle, or unit of three plus models, unless it is the closest target. So, uh, you, what happened in 8th edition, you could have uh, just minor characters camping out on objectives right at the back of the battlefield and you can do anything to try and pick them off unless you had snipers or trying to move a unit up to try and uh, get closer to them, uh, being allowed to shoot at them. But now, uh, if a character's isolated, less than nine wounds or less, and it's isolated it's on its own, uh, it can be shot at. What you'd need is to have like a bodyguard unit nearby to protect that character uh, and then uh, you'll not be able to shoot it. So, so uh, the way you want to try and protect characters now is you need some kind of bodyguard unit nearby. So whilst a character is within three inches uh, of uh, a unit, either an infantry unit with three or more models, so just about enough here, or a vehicle or a monster, then you can't pick on that character if it's got nine wounds or less. You've got to try and shoot through the bodyguard first of all. Uh, but say for example you'd offload a load of firepower into these and you manage to destroy them or just reduce them down uh, to less models in this case with the infantry uh, then you are able to start them picking on the character so characters got to be a little bit more careful now uh, in ninth edition got to make sure either you're hidden away out of line of sight uh, or indeed you've got some kind of bodyguard or protector unit uh, to try and shield them 
uh, from harm. I think it makes sense. Uh, these characters uh, that could be on their own entirely, just sitting out on top of objectives and no one's able to shoot at them, doesn't make sense. But the idea of lookout says that you've got friendly units nearby uh, to try and protect uh, the HQ units. Uh, and so Games Workshop have added in this rule now. You've got to be within three inches of a friendly unit, so that's a monster vehicle, or a unit of three plus models, unless it is the closest target. So I think it's a good move. Um, so something to bear in mind now if characters need a little bit more protection than what they had before. So then uh, another new rule here for blast weapons. Uh, so quite straightforward blast weapons, which they, they, they do list all the blast weapons here in the rulebook. Uh, minimum of three attacks against units of six or more models so you're getting a, a bonus here against larger formations of models which makes sense of blast weapons that's their speciality is you know fragmentation weapons that try and hit multiple uh, targets uh, so always make maximum number of attacks against units with 11 models so again a horde unit say 20 necron warriors you fire a God. Astro and Atari are going to be deadly now against Horde armies. Ouch. You're going to be maxing out your number of shots. <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be... I think Astro and Atari players are going to be very happy. So, I mean, like, firing at mortars, for example, at Hordes. It's going to be horrific. Yeah, Hordes are going to be in serious trouble. Multiple blast weapons in an army are going to be deadly for clearing away hordes. Interesting. Uh, they can never be used to attack units within the firing unit's engagement range. So you need to bear that in mind as well. Limb rush battle cannon, uh, no doubt will be a blast weapon. Can't fire that uh, if you have enemy units within uh, engagement range of that unit. So interesting. So really, your limb rush battle cannon, you have to declare it against another target because you don't even have the option to fire at enemy units of an engagement range. Interesting. So heavy bolters need to do that job to keep enemy uh, units away, or heavy flamers, or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's going to change things, I think. Weapon loadouts, for sure. Flamers are going to be great, I think, uh, for clearing enemy models away from engagement range. Okay, so moving on. Uh, making attacks... Okay, so uh, inflicting damage here. Uh, so there's the hit roll for ranged weapons and for melee weapons, then the wound roll. Uh, then uh, the allocate the attack. So the player uh, commanding the target unit selects one model in that unit. If a model in the unit has already lost wounds or has already had attacks allocated to it this phase, they must select that model. Uh, then comes your saving throw, inflicting damage. Uh, if a model is destroyed by an attack, any excess damage inflicted by that attack is lost, as per 8th edition. So, yeah, it's a, a two-wound model and it's six damage. It doesn't overflow into other models. It's, it's just all lost and that model's removed from play. Then, unmodified hit rolls, wound rolls, and saving throws of one always fail. Uh, that's remained the same. Unmodified hit rolls and wound rolls of six always succeed. So... I think that has remained the same. Yep. Uh, no, I because there's no such thing as can't hit anymore and can't wound, no matter what modifiers are stacked up. I think that's the way it works. Yeah, so no matter what shenanigans are going on when you're fighting against Eldar, <laughs> so on, um, it's always going to be sixes will always succeed with hits and with wounds. Uh, and then also they've said here, hit and wound rolls cannot be modified by more than minus one or plus one. So no more minus three to the hit roll and so on. Um, so I'm going to have to rethink my Eldar, for example. Um, stacking up the minuses to hit is no longer allowed. It's minus one maximum. Uh, just there. Interesting. Twists now. I think it's fair enough. Again, rules annoyed people. Multiple minuses stacking up where it got to a point where you couldn't even shoot at a target. It was so many modifiers stacked up. So Games Workshop have capped that off now. Plus one and minus one. So I, I, uh, the rules so far are pretty good, really. Just making the game perhaps more realistic. Which is great. Invan saves. I think this has all remained the same. Ignoring wounds. Mortal wounds. So onto the charge phase uh, next. So 
Yeah, so, right, okay, so, charging with a unit. I'll read this through here, I've marked this as, as new here. Declared targets of the charge, they must be within 12 inches. Uh, you roll your 2d6. If insufficient to charge to move charging unit into engagement range of all targets, the charge fails. Yeah, I think this is new. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. So, you declare a charge against multiple targets. Uh, when you roll up to charge, add, unless you've got to make sure that you the range reaches all of those declared targets. And if one of those is out of range, even if you can reach the others, the charge doesn't go ahead at all. And this is quite big. If insufficient to move charging unit into engagement range of all targets, the charge fails. Yeah, this is quite big. So, for example, uh, I have an Eldar Autark on a jet bike who ignores Overwatch. And sometimes I drive him in, fly him in, and then in the charge phase, I would say I'm charging everything because no one can Overwatch me, so I'm just going to charge everything. Uh, but now you've got to be more cautious now uh, with Ninth Edition because if, if a long distance charge fails to go ahead because you didn't roll high enough, then uh, even if there's an enemy unit you declare the charge against there just two inches away, the charge won't go ahead. So you've got a bit of tactics here, a bit of uh, weighing up who to charge against. You know, I've got an easy target to charge. Do I risk declaring a charge against another target that's further away and risk messing it up and not reaching the closest or the closer unit? So uh, there's that to weigh up as well. Yeah, there could be some frustrating moments. We don't quite reach a, a target that's further away and then you can't charge anything. The charge is successful, uh, make the charge move. Cannot make a charge move within engagement range of any unit that was not the target of the charge. So, I think that's new. I could be wrong, but I think that's, and, if, and it's quite significant actually. Heroic interventions. Uh, yeah, just a clarification here. Um, so what you get is, uh, you, it must be an enemy unit within three inches horizontally and five inches vertically to perform heroic intervention. It's a bit more stretched than if you're on a higher level. Uh, you can move five inches for vertical heroic intervention. Uh, charging over terrain. I'll just put a clarification here. Models can make a move freely over terrain features one inch or less in height. Models cannot move through taller terrain features but can climb up and down them. So pretty much the same as moving, you're measuring up and down and across and so on uh, for that. Then, uh, Overwatch, yeah, it's really, the rules will remain the same, but it's not available to everybody anymore, which I think is a shame, really. Um, yeah, I'm not sure on this one. They have, they have tweaked it here. So certain rules enable units to fire overwatch enemy unit before it can charge. So it's not everyone. It's just if you have the rule. So, uh, or the stratagem. There is a stratagem that lets you play overwatch now. But it's not everybody firing overwatch. If anything, it'll speed the game up a little bit. With loads of overwatch to resolve. It's like an extra shooting phase going on. That's all gone. So charges just roll up your charges. In you go. And that, you know, people will find, I think, that things will speed up a little bit and with that. Seems that Tau, who they have in the picture here, <laughs> to, are going to get Overwatch. You know, that's going to be an ability that they have, which is fair enough. Um, they should get it. Uh, but then the stratagem is also available for everybody else. Okay, so I, this, it is going to affect people severely because you're, you, you, you know, purchasing units deliberately with tons of flame weapons and so on, specifically to guard an Overwatch. What's going to happen with that? You still might be able to use them a bit with the stratagem, but uh, it's not as guaranteed as before. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think this has changed. So the fight phase then, uh, I'll maybe pick out this bit first of all. Charging units fight first. Units made a charge with this term fight before all other units. So charges fight first. Then, back to here, uh, starting with your opponent, alternate selecting units to fight with. So, I, I think it's the other way around. Usually, you resolve your charges, uh, and then in 8th edition, uh, if it's your turn, then you pick a unit to fight with. But here, 
I think the rule is now starting with your opponent, you alternate selecting units to fight with. Yep. And I guess then you'd, uh, you'd the interrupt play strategy may come into effect if it's available. Uh, then moving on, which models make your close combat attacks? Yeah, this has changed. I think this has changed. Which models can fight? A model can fight if it is within engagement range of an enemy unit. It's fine, within an inch. That's the same. A model can fight if it was within half an inch of another model from their own unit that is within half an inch of an enemy unit. Oof, boy, right, okay. So it has changed a fair bit. You're going to get less models fighting now because it was the ranges were longer for 8th edition. So, uh, your model, say, just for example, say this little thing here is the, the enemy model. So, this guy, as soon as he gets within an inch, he can fight. Uh, for his friend nearby, who wants to fight, you've got to make sure he's within half an inch, so a bit closer. And then he's got to make sure he's within half an inch to make sure he gets to attack as well. So it's tightened up a little bit, uh, going to half an inch. Next, uh, select targets. I've marked this as new here, so I'll, I'll call this out. If the attacking unit made a charge move this turn, its models can only target units that declared a charge move against this turn, or units that performed heroic intervention this turn. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it's changed now. So, as uh, Charges take place, heroic interventions. I think in 8th edition, you were not allowed to, uh, unless you declared a charge against a unit, uh, you're not allowed to do, uh, fight against a model that's heroically intervened against you. But now it seems that you can. If someone heroically intervenes against you, uh, even if you didn't charge them, then you can fight against them. Which makes sense. Why would you not be allowed to react to Rebute Gilliman heroically intervening? If the attacking unit made a charge move this turn, uh, its models can only target units that declared a charge against this turn, or units that perform heroic intervention. Yeah, so I think that's a little new bit, but quite you know it's quite significant game-wise. So morale phase uh, next here. So yeah, morale has changed. It's sort of in the same style as Eighth Edition. Uh, but I think they, they've worked on it a bit here and made it a little bit more complicated to a degree, but I think people will pick up on it quite quick. So I'll just call out the bullet points I think will work here. So morale test, you take a D6 as before, number of models uh, plus the number of models destroyed this turn. So uh, you lost five models, roll D6, uh, and then add that to the total. Uh, an unmodified so, say for example, uh, unit Necron Warriors, taking five casualties, roll a dice, you get a four. You add that together, you get nine. Uh, a leadership of ten, morale test is passed. Uh, roll again, five casualties, roll a six. So, five and six is eleven. Then uh, you fail by one, one model flees. An unmodified roll of a one is always a success, and no models flee. So then here comes the new bit. If morale test exceeds the unit's LD, uh, then one model flees, so you lose the model as per usual, and other models, so whatever the extra is, failed by an extra two or an extra five, whatever it is, uh, then those models must take combat attrition tests. So, new bit. <laughs> combat attrition tests. So, uh, you roll 1d6 for each remaining model in that unit, for each roll of a one, an additional model flees. So, it's not as harsh as it was really in 8th edition and uh, if you fail by 5 you lose 5 models but now if you fail by 5 1 model flees and you roll 4 dice and any 1's it's extra models running away uh, subtract 1 for combat attrition tests if the unit is below half strength so if you do get below half strength this is to represent the unit getting more and more shaky as, as heavier casualties are taken then it's minus 1 uh, if the test if the unit is below half strength, then it's ones and twos for models to continue uh, fleeing. Still, it's not as harsh as it was, sort of a limit there uh, now for morale. Uh, 
Then this one, I've written ouch here <laughs> for unit coherency. Ape seem to be a bit more lenient with this. Uh, I think it was in the movement phase. If you've found models outside of coherency, you just move them back in. But now you're doing your unit coherency check at the very end of the turn in the morale phase. So, uh, remove models from units in your army that are not within unit coherency. <laughs> that's, that's it. So you, you really... The, the way you place your models in a unit, you got to think really carefully about it. Um, you know, you've got a, a tactical squad, you've got a last cannon in that squad, uh, and you start taking other bolters away, and the last cannon finds itself stranded. It's just removed from play at the end of the turn. So... Place your models carefully now on the battlefield. Once all of outer coherency models have been removed, if any, the morale phase ends. The player's turn then ends, and unless the battle ends, the next player turn begins. So that's the very last thing, checking unit coherency. So I, I hope people don't get hung up on that or try and catch people out. You know, sort of hyper competitive, they say, oh, that's outer coherency, measure it up. Uh, but I, I doubt it. But, um, you know, if someone's playing harsh and to the letter of the law they could pull you up on that and then force you to remove models Ugh. but eight was more lenient than that so keep your coherency tight and be careful when removing models from plate because someone may well try and catch you out on that or just if you're going to stick to the, the rules as they're written then you can find yourself removing models from play uh because of coherency which i think it's a bit harsh really but uh, maybe they're making it tighter just to uh, limit perhaps the abuse of the more lenient rule for 8th edition. So I mean, the rules press on. I think I'm going to end part one here. Uh, I may well do part two. We'll see how well this video goes. See if it's been a help. Let me know in the comments section uh, if this has been a help to you. Really it's for those who are familiar with 8th and have been playing 8th edition and, I've, and uh, I've just been able to call out the changes and the clarifications to you so you can just make that switch over. Uh, it's ninth edition. I don't think there's any real panic, but there's a few small rules here and there that are quite big game changes here and uh, are going to affect the way perhaps you compose armies uh, as, as we go forwards in the ninth edition. What's beyond this is your mission packs, uh, stratagems, uh, forming your army up and so on. May well make a part two uh, just to try and help you out with the changes uh, there, which there are a fair few uh, changes uh, in those later sections as well. Uh, but that's the video helping you transition over to 9th edition uh, be sure to give the video a thumbs up it just helps me out pushes the video up in in the rankings on youtube and helps the channel out um, so do that it'll be much appreciated keep a look out for more 9th edition comment uh, content on the channel thanks for watching and tune in next time